Coming up, gunfire breaks out on a highway in Fargo. How one man is in jail while a hit and run victim fights to stay alive. Two North Dakota lawmakers are calling for a probe after the email account for the late attorney general was deleted. And a $4 million grant is awarded to an area homeless shelter. Hello and welcome to the Nightly Review. I'm Tom Tucker. We start things off with a look at tonight's headlines, then a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Cass County Sheriff Jesse Johnner, providing his thoughts on the response by law enforcement officers during the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. 21 people died in the shooting, including 19 students and two teachers. But first tonight, the man who exchanged gunfire with a state trooper on a Fargo Highway Tuesday is identified as 28-year-old Fargo resident Michael Yusa. He was shot just after 5 o'clock after crashing his pickup truck into a car while trying to transition from I-29 northbound onto I-94 eastbound. Yusa suffered non-life-threatening gunshot wounds and was treated at an area hospital before being taken to jail. Earlier in the afternoon, investigators say Yusa was involved in a hit and run involving a motorcyclist who suffered life-threatening injuries. They also say he fired a gun from an apartment balcony. A Fargo man is charged in Cass County Court, accused of holding a woman against her will and assaulting her. Police were called to a West Fargo apartment Monday after a woman called to say Brian Jonathan Jones came to her apartment and threatened to break down the door if she didn't let him in. The woman says Jones restrained her for about two hours while three children were sleeping. Jones denies assaulting the woman. Two North Dakota lawmakers are calling for a probe into the deleted email account for the late Republican Attorney General Wayne Stengem and the account of his former deputy. The calls yesterday followed the resignation Friday of Stengem's longtime assistant, Liz Brocker. Records show Brocker directed the email accounts to be deleted. An email from Brocker shows she made the request to delete the accounts to head off any open records requests for the emails. The CEO for Churches United in Moorhead says their homeless shelter, Micah's Mission, has been awarded a $4 million grant through Minnesota's Office of Economic Opportunity. Sue Kesterman says the grant will allow for a significant and much needed remodel of the shelter, including updating the HVAC system, adding a boiler, repairing the roof, renovating office spaces, and adding eight additional rooms for families. Cass County law enforcement, crews from rural fire departments, and EMS personnel teamed up for an active shooter drill last night at Northern Cass School in rural Hunter. The sheriff's office was part of a large presence of first responders and emergency vehicles at the school. Sheriff Jesse Johnner says a primary goal of the exercise was to improve coordination among the various participating agencies. A company from Southern California has just moved its operations to Fargo. The business provides freight logistics software. We really reduce that friction of less than truckload shipping. We benefit small truckload carriers. They represent roughly 90% of the capacity in the U.S. Wow. And they're really underserved from a technology perspective. Everyone tries to charge them a ton of money for software to make them more efficient. We give it away for free. And in exchange, we get a lot of access to their trailer utilization. The CEO and founder of CODA, Jeremy Vercota, told WDAY's Bonnie and Friends that he chose to move to Fargo because of the business climate, community support, and talent available for his business. To find out more about CODA, you can check out the story online right now at WDAYRadioNow.com. North Dakota's oil production is bouncing back after a stormy April. The State Mineral Resources Department says production in May reached more than a million barrels per day, and that's close to March's total. April production dropped below a million barrels a day for the first time in two years. Production peaked in November 2019 at more than 1.5 million barrels a day. The state of Minnesota is expanding its medical cannabis program. The Minnesota Department of Health has announced infused edibles will be legal for medical use beginning August 1st. Medical patients are required to schedule a consultation at a dispensary before changing the type of cannabis that they use. Meanwhile, South Dakota's first medical marijuana dispensary is set to open in Hartford next week. The brand new facility is owned by United Road. Co-owner Adam Jorgensen says the soft opening will happen June 27th. South Dakota voters approved the legalization of medical marijuana a year and a half ago. And a two-man team of anglers from Minot is taking home the North Dakota Governor's Walleye Cup.
Cody Pardon and Josh Gladback won the tournament on Lake Sakakawea over the weekend. The men beat out nearly 260 other teams to earn the prestigious trophy and the $15,000 top prize. Another team caught the largest walleye in the Governor's Cup history. That fish weighed more than 11 pounds. Well, we hope you find the Nightly Review to be a better source for news and information for all that is happening in the FM Metro and the surrounding region. If you do, please take a moment to subscribe and hit the bell button below. My six-year-old son will be happy to see more subscribers. Well, a beautiful day for us to enjoy weather-wise. Hopefully you had a chance to get out and enjoy it. The question now is how long will the conditions last? Meteorologist Justin Storm has answers from the Skywatch Weather Center. Throughout this evening, there will be a slight chance for an isolated storm or two until about 11 o'clock, then generally clear tonight. We'll drop down to a low of 60 with light wind out of the north 5 to 15. A little gusty at times on Thursday, but generally the wind will stay around 10 to 15 out of the west-northwest. Under mostly sunny skies, we'll hit a high near 86 Thursday afternoon and closer to 90 on Friday, partly cloudy with light wind. There will be a slight chance for a couple of showers or even an isolated storm or two as we head through Friday night into early Saturday morning. It could happen to you or someone you love. One moment, one diagnosis can change everything. Thankfully, there's a program that helps caring people uplift families through a crisis. Lend a hand up, raising financial help and hope through community benefits and online campaigns. A program that boosts generosity so gifts go further. Lend a hand up helps you help your neighbors. Learn more and give at lendahandup.org. Welcome back to the Nightly Review. Last night, the Cass County Sheriff's Department, along with rural fire departments and EMS personnel, conducted an active shooter training exercise at Northern Cass School in Rural Hunter, as we have reported. It's the first of four events happening in the county in the coming months, such training events. Last night on this program, we heard from Cass County Sheriff Jesse Johnner talking about the importance of the training. In part two of our conversation tonight, the sheriff offers his thoughts on how law enforcement responded to the mass shooting at the school in Uvalde, Texas. Yeah, most definitely I've had an opportunity to look at uh, the preliminary debrief, of course, and watch some of the video uh, footage and, and definitely the, the response time, the 72 minutes or 77 minutes that it took for law enforcement to get into that room is, in my opinion, unacceptable. Um, you know, we, we, again, we know that these things occur very quickly and a lot of people um, become injured or killed very quickly in these, in these situations. And so it, it's of the utmost importance that law enforcement gets on scene as quickly as possible and that they address that threat and neutralize it and stop that threat so more people don't get injured or killed. And that doesn't seem to be the case in this one, um, that there was an, a number of minutes in time that, that passed by before law enforcement was able to um, address that shooter. And so certainly... Uh, we look at that and we wonder why we look at the response um, and we really want to learn from it. Um, again, our whole goal, um, law enforcement's response in this area is to, as quick as possible, get in there and neutralize the threat. And so, um, you know, it, it, it is unfortunate and I don't want to talk bad about uh, a number of different law enforcement agencies, but just in reviewing um, the situation and again, the video footage, it, it, it is hard to watch. Um, and you kind of wonder why, why the response wasn't a little quicker to try to end that threat. In reviewing the incident and the response by law enforcement, I asked Sheriff Johnner what things that he and others in law enforcement might learn from what happened. Sure. So much like I mentioned, I saw the preliminary uh, debrief. And so, I, you know, it, it's certainly somewhat detailed, but I don't think it has all the details in there yet. So I don't know all the information that occurred. But when I watch it, you know, you, you certainly look at it and you want to make sure, number one, this, this shooter barricades himself in the room. Do we have the capabilities, the resources, the equipment to get into that room if that door is barricaded? Because if we can't get in there and stop the threat, that's an, that's an issue. And um, you know, we, we implemented a few years back, breaching equipment into our patrol vehicles. We didn't have it before then. Um, just ways that we can get into barricaded rooms if the shooter goes in there and barricades himself with, with innocent victims. And so certainly we, you know, I look at that and I wonder, did they have the proper equipment? Was the door even locked? I'm not sure if they checked it. Um, but there, there, 
there should have been a plan put into place real quick on scene and a response that was activated to, to try to end that threat. And I don't know if all those agencies train together, certainly that would be a takeaway if they aren't, right? Because we want everyone to be on the same page. And so, um, you know, I feel again, fairly confident that we are here. Um, and then, you know, I, I looked at some of the, the incident command um, structure and the failure to set up incident command and, um, you know, talking through some of those issues and how quick does that need to be set up? Um, and certainly in a situation like this, you don't need to wait for incident command to be set up to be given a go ahead to go in and stop or neutralize that threat. When you have someone actively engaging people, um, they show that the propensity for violence that they're gonna carry it out, they have the means to do so. Um, law enforcement needs to go in there. You don't need to set up an incident command to address that threat. People just need to go and they need to handle it. Where that incident command piece comes in is, um, you know, some of the some of the aftermath or some of the the things that need to occur immediately after that situation is resolved, and that's setting up casualty collection sites where people can be medically triaged, setting up reunification points where parents can come in and pick up their children, uh, making sure that hospitals are contacted for mass casualty situations and they can get the proper personnel into the hospital so they can start treating people. Um, you know, you're going to have an after event investigation. And so there's just a number of pieces and that's really where incident command comes in. But in the first part where that incident is actually, it's, act, it's, it's active, it's dynamic, things are transpiring, law enforcement has to go, they have to take care of that, that situation. I'd like to thank Cass County Sheriff Jesse Johnner for joining me for tonight's one-on-one -on -one conversation and for sharing his thoughts on the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Now the school board in Uvalde is meeting Saturday to talk about possibly firing District Police Chief Pete Arredondo for how he and his department responded to that shooting. Well, that will do it for this Wednesday night, July 20th, 2022. I'm Tom Tucker. Thanks for watching the Nightly Review.